Hello everybody and welcome to my Dark Souls Bosses ranking video. Before we get started, I'd like to specify some ground rules. First, this is based on if you were to use a fast rolling melee build like myself. And second, this is based on normal game and not normal game plus. Because I feel it's unfair to base bosses off significant stat buffs rather than their base form. Regardless, here are all 26 bosses in Dark Souls ranked from, in my opinion, easiest to hardest. Starting out with number 26, we have Pinwheel, who is without a shadow of a doubt the easiest boss in the game. Pinwheel seems to be having an identity crisis because his design makes you think he's for the early game, but in reality, the absolute headache that is the Catacombs is clearly meant for at the very least mid-game. His health is the equivalent of a P, and anything that could happen, you either dodge through or face tank. Plus, the copies he summons can be one-shot anyway. So yeah, let's move on. Number 25, Ceaseless Discharge. The unrelenting relief of load over here, and yes, that's its word-by-word -word definition, makes it seem like he's a hard boss. He has ludicrous damage that can one-shot the uncautious and has a gargantuan health bar. However, similar to the boss's name, this is played off as a joke. If you run back to the altar, then all the way back to the fog gate after that, the boss jumps up to you to cling onto the ledge. Then you just smack him a few times to send him tumbling to his doom. I will say that for some reason his AI tracking to do this straight up breaks unless you don't do this on your first attempt or go back to the altar after dying. The only reason this isn't the easiest boss in the game despite having a scripted death is because I'm required to use brain cells to fight this boss unlike Pinwheel. Sure it's only 3 but it's better than none. Number 24, Asylum Demon. Since I'm both an idiot and a masochistic bastard, I fought the Asylum Demon with a broken sword hilt on my first playthrough. However, now that I know you are supposed to leave and come back to this boss after exploring the Asylum, he's pretty much a joke, considering you can drop attack him for half his HP. If you somehow struggle to dodge his attacks that come out as fast as Professor Catjob's movement speed, then you can just hug his cheeks instead. He'll most likely just spam attacks that push you back with his butt to dodge them anyways. Number 23, Dark Sun Gwendolyn. Remember way back when in your childhood when you used to play things like Heads Up 7 Up, Free Stag, or daring somebody to hold onto the monkey bars with their teeth and juggling at the same time? Well, good, because y'all better remember Red Light, Green Light, since this is just that but the boss. I will admit, I died the first couple times I fought this boss because I thought the shotgun went straight through the pillars like the beam did, but now that I know it doesn't, this is what you gotta do. Dodge the laser, hide behind pillars when the shotgun happens, and make a beeline for the boss once he starts shooting arrows. It's as boring as that. The only wrench in the works is when his shotgun attack is immediately followed up with a laser beam since this forces you to dodge out into the open, but still not that bad. You'd really think for a literal god he would do anything besides make the hallway really long for the sole purpose of doing this, but guess not. Number 22, Taurus Demon. I could argue this is an even better tutorial boss than the Asylum Demon. How so? It emphasizes how important it is to explore and get better gear or explore mechanics in order to win against a boss. For example, if you pick up the Gold Pine Resin, knock the Taurus Demon off the bridge, or drop attack from the tower, then this fight is even easier. It's honestly astonishing how good the tutorial areas are in this game. However, for the purpose of this video, I decided to not deploy any of those tactics, since the Taurus Demon isn't that bad once you realize his lingering hitboxes last longer than the amount of time it will take you to finish your first playthrough. Simply bait out an attack, go in for a quick hit, and repeat. I find it dangerous to fight him up close since his auto tracking is honestly one of the best in the game, but you can still dodge them with practice of his tells. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that you need to kill these archers before starting the fight because otherwise you'll probably get stunlocked by them. After making it through Bowser Jr's fun house over here, I was practically pissing myself at the fact that I did need to fight a boss. However, like most giant things in this game, just camp behind his ankles during the fight. He really can't do much about this due to 
to his sheer size unless he goes for a grab attack and that's basically the only danger in this fight. Aside from a few other attacks, he happens to get close to positioning correctly. Eventually, he starts wobbling like a toddler and you can knock him off if he's positioned correctly. But even if he's not, he collapses onto the ground for a significant amount of time because yeah, I self-diagnosed myself with a deadly fear of ants the other day and passed out when I saw one on my leg. Anyways, unless he somehow manages to toss you off a cliff, there's nothing to worry about. Number 20, Centipede Demon. What is one of the coolest boss designs to me is rather easy. First, sprint over to this area to the right, which is much larger to fight in. You'll be fighting the camera as much as the boss if you don't. After he's done bruising his knuckles, after realizing you know how to dodge to the left, he just kind of flails around. The only two moves you really need to look out for is when he leaps like a frog into the air and sends a fireball down to the ground or his foot stomps. You can also chop off the various parts of his body, which will start attacking you. Not only is that hilarious, but you can also get the orange charred ring early should you feel the need to fight him out in the open. Number 19, Moonlight Butterfly. The Moonlight Butterfly isn't hard, it's just that I suck. I have no idea how I managed to get hit by this single spread shot attack nearly every time it goes off. But luckily for me, I can just spam Estus to recover anything this boss does anyways. You can't hit the boss until it decides to fly down to feed off the moss to recharge its mana if you're a melee build. Also, as low as my IQ may be, wouldn't the smart thing to do be feeding anywhere else? Oh well, who cares, this Seath experiment's dead anyways. Speaking of Seath, number 18, Seath the Scaleless. Before we even continue, I would like to acknowledge one thing. Getting this guy's tail is not that hard. You just bait him over so he can destroy his own crystal, immediately move once you see him charging up, and claim your Moonlight Greatsword. Aside from that though, this boss doesn't do much. Hell, the clam that I definitely did not in any way, shape, or form forget to kill is more difficult than this guy. Pretty much every attack can be dodged by just camping at his stomach or running away. And the only real attack you need to watch out for is his chest beam attack since it's really all he can do to protect himself. I will say that this tentacle attack rarely goes off unless you're near his tail, so really no need to worry about that either. Also, again, any damage you could take during this fight can be healed by just running away. Number 17, Gaping Dragon. Take out this mage before going into the fight itself. If you don't, he'll not only be shooting at you the whole fight, but also buff the boss to one-shot capabilities, which is worse than being two-shot if you're good at math. See, going into this, I expected a disgusting boss, because we're in a sewer after all. But my brain shifted into maximum overload, trying to comprehend if this was a certain area with teeth, a taco, or a Venus flytrap. Due to the answers you guys told me when I asked, I have come to the conclusion that this is just a dick sporting goods enthusiast who eats way too much Taco Bell while also having a Venus flytrap at his ex-girlfriend's house. Why ex-girlfriend? Because he's one of those guys on My Strange Addiction who drinks straight out of the toilet. Oh yeah, I forgot the fight. Go for the tail. Its deadliest attack is by far the tail that spans across an entire football field and still hits like a freight train. Plus, you can get a free weapon anyway, so may as well. After that, you either bait out the charge attack since it takes years to recover from it or stick to its hind legs. All you really have to worry about is the grab attack, because not only does it appeal to every person with a vor fetish, but it also seems to have a magnet attached to it due to how large the hitbox is. Number 16, Capra Demon. It's the arena. It's smaller than my bathroom and there's dogs. The Capra Demon himself is really just a faster and smaller Taurus Demon without lingering hitboxes. You either kill the dogs or they kill you, plain and simple. Easiest way to mitigate this problem is to run to the right side of the Capra Demon, dodge his attack should you need to, and then make a beeline for the stairs. The dogs will most likely follow you up there before the Capra Demon himself, and even if they don't, just hop off the stairs since they have a landing recovery animation. You can honestly just camp ledge drops the entire fight if you really want to. Number 15, Stray Demon. The Stray Demon is mostly just a don't get too greedy fight. 
I found that if you hug his cheeks like his previous incarnation, he'll spam his slam and slow wind up AoE blast. This allows you to slowly whittle down his health bar while requiring the patience to not fall asleep. He will occasionally use this AoE blast which is just better start running or die, and the boss can basically one shot you with any move should you let him, thus putting him higher on the list. Number 14, Crossbreed Priscilla. If there was a single boss that I'm most inconsistent with fighting, it's this poor girl that just wants to be left alone. She kindly asks you to just leave her home because she doesn't want to be hurt. Since this is a video game and I'm obliged to not care about feelings though, of course I attacked her. This is where it gets inconsistent. The boss goes invisible but can be tracked with her footprints. Now, I have absolutely no idea what I do right and wrong when I fight this boss, but sometimes I'll track her near perfectly, and then other times she seems to teleport every time I try to get near her. Heck, I somehow managed to die after getting her tail when she went invisible again. Yet, I did this nearly hitless on my first and third playthroughs. In any case, she's not that bad since you can get her out of being invisible and at that point it becomes easy. Number 13, Grave Lord Nido. Take what I said about the Capra Demon's dogs, apply it on a somewhat higher scale but with a slightly more open arena, and you have Nido. Nido himself boils down to sticking to him like glue so his attacks pass over you or are easy to dodge. Aside from the AoE blast which is again run or die. Whereas the three musketeers over here may as well be the boss. You'll want to take them out, hopefully before Nido gets to you. Along with praying, Nido isn't spamming his anal probe the entire time. If you do, you win. There's not much else to say really, except for the love of god, do not trigger the giant skeletons in the left corner of the room. They have a pretty low aggro range, so as long as you know they're there, you can avoid triggering them. Number 12, Quaylog. I know a lot of people like to focus on this image, but I'd like to ask something different for once in my life. How in the name of God does her stomach system work at all? Like, does only the spider eat? Does only she eat? Do both of them eat at the same time? I need answers from Soft. Quaylog's attacks mainly come from the front, so it's best to stick to her sides. Her sword attacks do have a weird hitbox and tracking to them, so I find it best to dodge them anyways. But the real danger here is the lava that builds up over time. You'll need to reposition her, she essentially causes a volcano to erupt in the area you're fighting her. There's also this AoE blast which has one shot potential, a gigantic hitbox, and is really annoying to predict since it seems like her AI tracking just broke half the time she uses it. You can interrupt her by attacking the front of her, but since you're most likely to the side of her when she starts doing it, it's just better to run. In my first playthrough she actually spammed this move which led to me being pissed off at her, but that was just awful RNG which hasn't happened since. Number 11, Fire Sage Demon. Remember how I said with the stray demon he would spam the slow wind up AoE blast and the slam rather than the quick AoE blast? The Fire Sage is the opposite of that. Hell, I had it on my first few runs where he solely used this move the entire fight. This hits even harder than the Stray Demon and can be combined easily with either another AoE blast or an axe swing to the face. Other than that though, it's basically the Stray Demon 2.0 and Asylum Demon 3.0. Nothing else much to say for a reskin of a reskin. Number 10, The Bed of Chaos. I'll admit this boss has gotten much better than when I made a video on it. That's not to say it's a good boss by any means, just that it's not up there with Markoth without a floor anymore. That being said, this is really just trial and error. Taking out the first whatever causes the floor to start falling, but you don't get to see which areas will fall until you're a millimeter in front of them. This means you'll probably mess up and send yourself cascading down into the bottomless pit below. Taking out the other side whatever causes this AoE fire attack to happen, which also has one shot potential if multiple of the spouts spawn in the same spot since they're unblockable. Oh yeah, I also forgot to mention the entire time this is happening, the bed of bull over here is spamming sweep attacks that send you flying into said pits on the floor. Once you finally do destroy both sides, it's time to just make a leap of faith to the boss and pray to god it doesn't use the fire spouts on your way there. However, this boss does have checkpoints when you destroy a side thingy. 
This means you can quite literally suicide with no repercussions outside of lost souls if you want. And the hardest part of the boss is just getting to the second whatever after a few tries. Thus, while being difficult for mainly just being a platforming boss in a game based around dodging and or blocking in combat, it doesn't get to rank much higher than this due to the aforementioned trial and error. Number 9. Bell Gargoyles the bell gargoyles really just come down to how prepared you are for it. If you upgrade your weapon a lot prior to the fight, then yes, this fight is piss easy because you can 5 shot them. However, after doing this once, I realized how striking the difficulty difference is here when you can down the first gargoyle so quickly. The fight with one of them is relatively easy, but then both gargoyles gain the ability to spam fire breath that covers half the arena should they wish, which led to me being cornered multiple times. Number 8, Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. I feel like out of anywhere on this list, except for number 7, which we will get to momentarily, this will be where people disagree with me the most. That's mainly because I'm basing it off both factors of this fight. On the one hand, Gwyn is arguably the most aggressive boss in the game, able to dish out incredible damage in a single combo, and holding an Estus flask in front of him is violating the law. On the other hand, you can parry him. Parrying Gwyn makes the fight arguably one of the easiest in the game. However, as someone who never really did parry that much throughout the game since blocking or backstabbing was far less risky and almost as effective in the case of backstabbing, I basically used Gwyn to practice parrying, eventually beating him as a result. Still, this balance of being arguably the hardest and quite possibly BS boss in the game due to how aggressive he is if you can't parry him or or being as easy as the Asylum Demon if you can really is what lands him here on the list. Number 7, Great Grey Wolf Sith. And this is where I feel people, in a similar manner to Gwen, will disagree with me the most. I feel like the reason I find Sif to be moderately difficult is because I go to her immediately after fighting the Bell Gargoyles and the Stray Demon, when she seems to be designed for after finishing an Orlando. Almost all her attacks seem to one or two shot me, and this Beyblade move is by far the deadliest move in her arsenal, as she usually uses it when I think she's going to use a charge attack. Speaking of said charge attacks, these are also quite hard to predict, since most of the time she just seems to walk towards you until you get close enough for her to hit you with the very tip of her blade. However, there is one glaring weakness that keeps Sif from ranking higher on this list, and that is that getting under her effectively dodges her entire arsenal until she repositions. Thus, it really boils down to dodging the initial hit and then camping under her the rest of the fight. Still, if you get unlucky, she'll jump around like Mario. Number 6, Four Kings. It's the depth perception. Half the time I can't even tell if I'm dodging in the right direction because it's just pitch black in the arena. None of the moves are really hard to dodge, save for this AoE scream grab attack that will always catch you unless you have the reaction speed of a god, this homing ring of death, or spin to win. Saying that out loud, I just realized that's half their move set, so yeah, never mind, their moves are also difficult to dodge. Luckily though, you take minuscule damage if you are up close to them during their sword attacks as you only take damage from the hilt. So in theory, you can face tank them. If you take too long, more kings will appear throughout the fight. However, this rarely comes into effect unless they decide to use a spell-based attack since they wait their turn to beat you like every good kindergartner. Also, the boss name is a lie. I've seen up to 7 kings before. Dark Souls, please learn how to count. Number 5, Sanctuary Guardian. I've always sucked at fighting the Sanctuary Guardian. He was by far the most aggressive boss I've fought up to this point, and taking into consideration that his move pool is incredibly diverse, featuring follow-up combos, projectiles, and counters, you can kind of see why he's this high. The most effective method I've found for beating him is dodging away from his attacks and waiting for him to either use the wave attack, which has a very long recovery animation, as long as you don't get hit by the wave, that is, and his charging headbutt, which has a similar long recovery. Surprisingly, his HP is quite low, so yeah, just punish these moves and you're golden. Number 4, Knight Artorius. Up until this point, I would say most of the bosses on this list are moderately difficult at most, 
save for maybe the Sanctuary Guardian and of course Gwyn if you can't parry. The top four are really the only bosses I consider to be hard in the normal game. Artorius is no pushover. Despite being insane and injured when you fight him, Artorius moves more fluidly and faster than any other boss so far, save for Gwyn. His moveset is completely erratic yet graceful and can follow up many of his moves with counterattack. There's also his Beyblade, which like Sif is easily his deadliest move. You have to dodge away from this attack unless you plan on blocking it, because the second hit of it will always hit you should you dodge through the first one towards him. He can also buff himself. Do not, under any circumstance, unless you are fully confident in your ability to dodge, let him do this. His damage will skyrocket to near, if not one-shot potential. You can interrupt this buff by attacking him continuously when he tries to do so. Still, you need to be able to recognize and react to all of Artorius's tells, because otherwise you're dead due to his aggression making healing windows limited in this fight. Number 3, Dragon Slayer Ornstein and Executioner Smo. Ornstein and Smo comes down to one thing, how effectively you can use the pillars. If you use them to separate Ornstein and Smo's aggro for brief moments to get some hits in, you win. If you don't, you'll either get cornered and or die shortly thereafter. I personally focus Smo before Ornstein because Ornstein seems to be a really big fan of spamming the dodge button. And I can use Smo effectively as a shield sometimes for making Ornstein miss. Smo himself is incredibly easy to dodge outside of the occasional weird tracking of his charge attack, meaning all you have to worry about is Ornstein interrupting. The only problem I have with the first phase of this boss is Ornstein's charge. He'll sometimes zoom straight towards you and other times stub his toe before randomly accelerating to Mach 10 again. Once you down either one of them, you have to deal with either a supersized Ornstein or a lightning-powered Smo. In the case of Giga Pikachu, it actually makes the fight easier once you get past the initial attacks that it'll probably use as soon as the fight begins. Like Iron Golem, you can just camp at his ankles, although you will have to be wary of his lightning slam and a few attacks that can clip you like the back hop. I've only fought the lightning-charged Snorlax twice, but from what I've seen, he's basically the same fight as normal Smo, except this ground pound has an even larger hitbox. So while the second phase is only moderately difficult, the first phase easily earns a spot on the list. Number 2, Black Dragon Calamite. Originally, I was disappointed that Calamite just seemed to be an environmental hazard, but thanks to the power of Google and watching Hawkeye be a badass and shoot down Calamite, I was exhilarated. Calamite's speed is jarring. There's some moves that take a while to come out like that of the neck swipe, and other moves that come out nearly instantly like the charge swipe attack. All of these moves have potential follow-ups like his double foot stomp, so the name of the game is good positioning. Kalami also has some really wonky lingering hitboxes like that of his neck swipe where you'll get dragged with his head if you dodge into it. Oh yeah, did I mention Kalami can debuff you temporarily to take double damage meaning you'll get one shot? by most of his attacks? Yeah, good luck with that. Also, let's not talk about the true boss fight, Calamite's Tail. Trying to get Calamite's Tail is by far the most obnoxious thing to deal with in the game, since there's really only three attacks where he will lower his tail for you to hit it, being his fire breath downwards, the Calamity Vision debuff, or his tail slam when you're behind him. At least the power attack for the weapon is stylish as hell. But there is still one other boss that manages to beat Kalami, and that is number one Manus, Father of the Abyss. Take the aggression and combos of Artorias along with the damage and wonky hitboxes of Kalami, add in the factor of being pissed off, put them all together, and you have Manus. Manus may as well be named the father of combos because this man can string together so many different attacks and makes every other boss look like they just woke up from hibernation. He's got ranged hits, he's got close range swipes that seem to clip you half the time despite dodging directly through them, he's got a counter specifically designed to prevent you from smacking that booty, he's got a wombo combo that will always connect with you unless you run the near instant he yells, he's got spells that all have similar tells and vary to a very high degree, 
The list goes on. Combine all that with the fact that Manus is absolutely relentless, and the only safe opportunity you have to heal during this fight is during a slam attack or the wombo combo if you dodge them. Having all the aforementioned factors and a Jupiter-sized health bar makes Manus easily the hardest boss in the game in my opinion. But let me know what you guys think down below. Think Pinwheel is the pinnacle of difficulty, or Manus is easier than knocking Ceaseless Discharge off a ledge? Let me know. I'm planning on doing Dark Souls 2 next, even though I did try it out and the controls are really unresponsive for some reason. But I'm hoping the more I progress in the game, the more I'll get used to it. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed.